All right. Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Is anybody there? Sorry. Yeah, we can hear you, Professor. Yeah. Sounds good. How are we doing? I'm doing well. How about you? Getting to the end of the semester. Uh, so we are. We have two more lectures left, and um, so we have this week and next week. Uh, there's only uh, there's only one. No, there are two. So, so we have two more lectures left, and um, my plan originally was to have the exams uh, next week, but Anna says we can't do that. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the exams uh, in the exam period. And if you have signed up for a slot, check that I put you in correctly on Canvas. If you have not signed up for a slot, uh, send me an email and sign up for one of the remaining slots. Uh, the format of the um, uh, of the final is going to be similar to the, to what you saw with in the midterm. Uh, we're going to look over uh, one of the old homework problems. Um, are there any questions, or is there something you want me to go over again, or should we just continue with uh, forwards and futures? Last time we spent uh, we spent some time in the beginning. Oh, on, uh, professor, yeah, did you post? Um, you know, you had that review sheet with like it was like sixty practice problems. Is that on Canvas? Yeah. Oh, um, I wasn't able to find it. Okay, let me let me see if I can help you. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it, it should be there. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, oh wait, I see it now. Yeah. Just uh, right. Final practice. They've been updated a little bit because I added some of these problems on um, densities, um, which we talked about last time. So not all these problems are relevant. Um, there are some problems in there about um, uh, these stopping time problems, which we haven't we haven't we haven't discussed uh, section five in the textbook this year. Okay, are there are there any are there any questions or topics that I should talk about, or should we just continue with the lectures? Okay, then. Uh, so, so we are we are doing fixed income. All right. So this year is three. Uh, chapter six. All right, and the word fixed comes from the fact that the um, the payments uh, for the zero coupon bonds. The are the equal to one, so there's no randomness in the payments themselves. This is why it's called fixed. So we're looking at the so the, the thing that is not fixed, the thing that's random here is the interest rate. So the stock, there's no stock. There's a the bank account it has the usual form, and that's that's how we usually write it. But now the the new thing is that there is a uh, there's a stochastic process here for um, for the interest rate, but this year is now a stochastic process. The interest rate is uh, is time varying, and we looked at some examples last time, and we look at more examples uh, today. But there are some main models. So this is in discrete time. Um, there's the Ho and Lee. Ho and Lee model. That one says that the interest rate, right? So the interest rate, this is what takes you from what right, you're sitting here at time n minus one, and then takes you over to time n. So here's the interest rate. It moves you, it moves $1 from here over to one plus uh, in minus one, and please note that this is this is not R n. This is R n minus one. So the interest rate is measurable with respect 
to the information you have in the beginning of the interval. And that's different than the stock because you don't know what the stock's return is over the next interval, but you do know what the return is on the bank over the next interval. But this quantity here, this is if n minus one measurable. <clears throat> okay, so in the whole Lee model, the interest rate is given as uh, a deterministic function, a n plus b n, and then times the number of heads. So remember the CSD, this is the number of heads in first n tosses. So that's the whole Lee model. A and B are constants. Here, uh, time varying constants. They're not random. And so that whole Lee, this is a model that, um, that people care about. And another example is the uh, Black Derman. Uh, toy model. And it's quite similar. Instead of addition, you multiply. So a n times b n, and then here you put it up to a power number of h n. These are two, two uh, specifications. Um, that you will see in uh, in the text. I think there might also be some problems. I, I forget, um, but there are of course many other specifications of how R n is. Each specification of R n is going to lead to a different model. So that's that's the starting point for fixed income. We have a bank. There's no stock here. There's just a bank, uh, and the bank carries a an interest rate which is stochastic. But it is, however, fixed at the beginning of each interval. Right? So i n minus one, you know what that is here in the beginning. And that's true for all periods. So this. Any questions on this? So, so this is one security that the um, uh, that can be that is traded. The price is given according to this formula. We always start out the bank account. We always start out at start out at one. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing you do with fixed income, and this is where the, the word fixed come in. Um, you're looking at bonds, so we're looking at zero coupon bonds. Okay, so what is a zero coupon bond? Well, we have time here. Then there is some. There's some maturity M. And this is where the fixed part comes in because at time M, you're going to get $1. That's the payoff. Now, what you're interested in knowing is what is the price? What is the price of getting $1? What is the, what, what is the fair value of $1 in the future, given that you're sitting here at an earlier time? Well, what we're going to put here is going to be this B and M, right? The zero coupon bond price at time N prior to expiry at time capital M. Right? This here is maturity. This is maturity, right? And this here is current time. We talked about last time that it is no, it's not the case that you can just do one over the interest rate here. It won't work because this thing here, BN must be FN measurable. And it must be that if I take N to be M, it must be equal to one. And it must be that when I discount, because this is the price of a traded security, it must be that when I discount by the bank, I get a P tilde Martingale. So 
So all these things, they lead us to say that, that B in M is defined as, right? So that's the definition. This is the conditional expectation of, of what? Of S M zero. So that's the bank. That's this one here. The zero is up there. So we have the bank account times M divided by this is at time n divided by the bank account time m given fn. And now you can see you have all the properties that you want because if I take n and m to be the same, this is a one. You can see that it is fn measurable because I'm conditioning here on fn. And you can see that this is a P tilde Martingale because if I divide through, right, this here is n measurable, so he can jump outside here, you can divide him over, and then it's the conditional expectation of a random variable that is a Martingale. So you have all these properties using, uh, if you define the zero coupon bond according to this formula. So that's, that's going to be our formula for zero coupon bonds. So the, the, the trader, so traders can trade. He can trade the bank. He can trade the zero coupon bond with all kinds of expiries. So S N M for M equals one, two, and so on. So you can trade all these securities. Okay, so any questions on this aspect? We good so far? So then the thing we did last time was we're gonna start looking at the um, gonna start looking at derivatives. And uh, the first one we, the one we looked at last time was a forward. So let's look at forwards. So forwards <coughs> forwards they come uh did they pay off at some particular date in the future so the forward will pay off uh, sometime in the future say time capital n and then there will be there'll be a um, the payoff is going to be something uh, random so say s n minus the forward price and so if current time is little n then the payoff is going to be something you know, can we call this here for let's call it k last time Right, KN, KN is measurable where we currently sit. S capital N, this is that random variable. Uh, that's that underlying randomness that we're striking a forward on. So we could have, so, so examples could be that uh, SN uh, is an interest rate. Right, so that one here, this is not a price process. The interest rate is not a price, it's a rate. And you could have that SN would be a zero coupon bond, say uh, that expires at uh, some later time, say N plus 10, this is a price process. Right, because the zero coupon bond is the price of something that is traded. <clears throat> the forward price, this is this guy KN here. KN is called, it's called the forward price. If, if the value of getting that payoff here, the value of the payoff is equal to zero at time zero, at time n. So zero is equal to, and then the conditional expectation. We're getting this payoff here at time capital N. So we will roll it out. And we'll roll it back to time zero, right? And then move it forward to time little n. And then we're conditioning on it. 
Right, so Kn, this is it's called the forward price if it satisfies this requirement. And of course we can solve for it. We can solve for this. We can, what can we do? We can move the K into the other side. So if I move the K into the other side, I will have here Kn outside. Then I'll have Sn zero divided by S capital N zero, given if N. Uh, what will be left in here will be the conditional expectation of Sn over Sn zero given it. And what we find here is, this is my zero coupon bond. So I have Kn times the zero coupon bond has to be equal to this conditional expectation. And now we can see the difference, right? If, if you are a price process, then if I'm a price process and I discount, I'm gonna get a martingale here. So this thing here is easy to compute when Sn uh, is the price of a traded security, then you know that Sn divided by Sn zero is a P tilde martingale. And so this becomes very easy to compute. However, when Sn is like a rate, then this here is not easy to compute and it's much more involved. And so the focus here uh, this morning is gonna be working more on this condition expectation. Are there any questions before we look at, look at the problem? Your homework this week is about, it's about these, um, these contracts. Are there any questions on, on what we have so far? Otherwise, I propose that we look at it. We look at a problem. Uh, let me just bring it up. The problem I want to look at is. Where is it? I can't find it now. Let's try this again. Ah. Uh, why is it not showing? All right, can you see my problem sheet here? This final practice problem. So what I wanna look at is this one here, problem number 31. <clears throat> so problem number 31 is one of these scenarios. It's, it's, it's one of these complicated cases because the underlying random variable that the forward is struck on is uh, not traded, it's that interest rate. So the, the rates are not prices of traded securities, right? Rates are uh, used to describe the price of uh, the bank, but itself is not a, uh, a price. So we were being asked in a specific model to calculate to calculate the, uh, the forward price. And this is the forward price this time at time zero. So let me write down what the model says. So Rn, I'm just copy pasting the formula for the interest rate. This is the important part. This is one plus I in, and then there's an epsilon n plus one minus one in there. And the epsilons, the uh, IID, and you take two values, uh, U and D as we used to. Okay, so I just copy pasted what was in the problem formulation on my, my sheet of paper. So the forward, the forward pays Rn minus F zero uh, 
at the end. And the fair forward price is the one, is this one we have here. And so now we're gonna use everything here with, with zero. So K zero, that's my F zero in the problem. Here we're gonna get a one, then downstairs you're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have the zero coupon bond B zero, uh, B zero N. And then on the right hand side, this is where the trouble is. This is that ratio we have to calculate. So the, the F zero times B zero N needs to be this conditional expectation, uh, Rn divided by is in zero. Right, so the challenge is, the challenge is to work out what is this conditional expectation? And again, had this been traded, had this been a price process of something, then this expectation here would just be equal to R zero um, because of the Martingale property, but we don't have that here. So instead there's a lot more work to be done and um, let me try to take you through it. It's asking for a recursive formula. It's asking for a recursive formula. Let me just read out loud what the question asks asking for. Uh, provide a recursive formula to calculate this F zero. So provide a recursive formula for F zero. And the tricky part is gonna to be to compute this expectation here on the right-hand side. So what, what, how do, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this? Uh, so what is the, so the claim is, the claim is that uh, there exists Fn of X and there exists Gn of X such that when I compute conditional expectations of, um, of what, of En tilde of one plus R capital N divided by S capital N zero. Right, so I'm trying to get at this one here. So we have Rn and we have Sn zero here. I'm claiming that this thing here is equal to computer conditional expectation. You're gonna get something that is Fn measurable. So this here has to be Fn What is it going to be Fn? Maybe we should just, yeah, maybe we should take it one step at a time. If we go from, yeah, maybe we should take it one step at a time. How does, how do we get started on something like this? Well, we, what we need to do is we need to use the definition of Rn. So if I were to look at the, I want to look at the, so, so let's move it back one step at a time. So let's look at N equal to N minus one. Look at the conditional expectation of one plus Rn divided by Sn and then divide the uh, condition on Fn minus one. So move it back just one step and see what we can get out here. <clears throat> so, the focus is on Rn plus one, because if I move this one to the other side, I'm gonna get a nice expression for, uh, for the top part. Right, so how would one go about doing this? Well, we'll, we'll compute one plus Rn. So this is to the other side. Then you have one plus Rn minus one times epsilon n. 
And then what you divide by is S in minus one times one plus, and then you have I in minus one given Fn times one. And so what does it become? Well, you can see now the way that it's set up is such that you get cancellation. What you have downstairs here and what you have upstairs, it will cancel. This thing here is gonna go outside as Sn minus one is zero. And then you'll have epsilon capital N given Fn minus one. And then you'll use that the epsilons, they're independent. So this conditional expectation here is just going to be the unconditional expectation of epsilon n. And that one we know how to compute. That one we know how to compute. This is p tilde times u plus one minus p tilde times d. Good, good so far. This is the calculation we've done a bunch of times before. Okay, then <clears throat> we would also be interested in, so we have to move this one back as well. So how do we how do we pull? How do we pull? Uh, how do we pull this one here further back? So we need something like um, we need the ability to be able to to move back recursively one over s capital n. So let's try to do that one. How would one we should be in there? So we do the same thing. We insert one over s in minus one times one plus r in minus one given f in minus one. And now everything here is going to be measurable. So this is exactly the same as s in minus one. And so what happens if I move it to? So if I move it back two times, so what happens if I compute the condition expectation of this one more time? This will be one over Yes, n minus one, one over one plus r n minus one given f n minus two. Now it becomes harder. So this is one over s n minus two. And then it's one plus r n minus two, one over one plus r n minus one given f n minus two. Now the first part here is measurable, so we can put them outside. And now we have to use, we have to compute the condition expectation here. And what is one plus, all under the tilde measure, what is one plus i in minus one? Well, this is where we have the formula. This is where we have the formula. We move the one to the other side. We're going to get uh, we need this here to be n minus n minus one. We need this to be n minus one. So <clears throat> we will have one plus r n minus two. 
times epsilon n minus one. So what would we get is this thing can go outside. This thing can go outside and it get squared. And then we left with one over epsilon n minus one, it's independent of fn minus two. You can calculate what this one here is. This is one over is n minus two, zero, one over one plus r n minus two squared. And then it's gonna be p tilde one over u plus one minus p tilde uh, one over d. Follow these steps. What we're doing is what we're doing is we're trying to figure out how do we calculate how do we calculate uh, how do we calculate uh, if zero solving this equation here so the way to get a handle on it is to start by going back going back one step say and then what do you get out well you'll have to go back this one here is going to become a, a constant because you have independence and then this one here is uh, this one here is of course random it's going to be measurable with respect to what you condition on and then how do you compute the expectation here? Well, you plug it in and then you, uh, so you plug in what is the, uh, what are the two values that epsilon n can take and you weigh them with the probabilities. Okay, so then you're ending up with something that looks like one over Sn minus one. Okay, so then what you need to figure out is how do I calculate the conditional expectation of something like this? So you start at the end, you go one back, see what happens. So here you're good because when you go one back, you are already measurable, so there's nothing to compute. But then what happens then if you go two back? <clears throat> and you're starting to see that there is there is some structure, right? There's something like what you have here is the same term appears again, and then there's a correction term. And then there's a, like this one here is also random, right? And then you have the a coefficient that you need to carry along with you. Are there questions on what we did here? So what, what is then the general structure? So the general structure the general structure, looking at these formulas, you will recognize there is some sort of a pattern. So the general structure is that you can find functions such that one plus uh, the functions evaluated at one plus Rn. Uh, over is in zero. This has uh, this is the conditional expectation of uh, one plus R n divided by uh, S n. And and how would one get so the general structure that exists these F n's such that something like this here holds? What would have to be the case and what is F n at the end? I take fn at the end, what should it be equal to? When you look at the formula, you take n to little n to be capital N, the formula will say that this is fn of one plus rn divided by s capital N. This is this conditional expectation on the right hand side. But now you're given fn. So everything here is now measurable. So this is one plus Rn divided by Sn zero. Okay, so what should Fn here be? You'll need Fn of X to be, these will cancel out. You'll have Fn of one plus R, it's gonna be exactly one plus R. So you need Fn of X to just be X. 
So that's how it ends up being. Okay, so what about at earlier times? So when you're looking at n less than n, how do I figure this out? Well, <clears throat> you have the formula that you want to be true. You have the formula that you want to be true. So if I'm looking here at it strictly less than, then I'll have Fn of one plus Rn divided by uh, Sn zero. This is this conditional expectation. And then I can use iterated expectations. I can plug in a conditional expectations in the middle. Let me write them with n. here. So I'll do e tilde of n plus one, and then one plus r n over s n zero. Right, so that was iterated expectations. And then you'll use that, what you have on the inner one, what you have on the inner one, this is exactly, this is gonna be Fn plus one, Fn plus one evaluated at one plus Rn plus one divided by Sn plus one zero. Okay, right, so I need the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side. And how do I work out what the right-hand side is? <clears throat> well, we use the formula just as we did before in this specific case. So we write this here as e tilde n f n plus one, and then we'll insert. We'll insert what is one plus i n plus one. So then we need that formula. The one we had before, right? I have one plus i n plus one. Maybe I should write it out here. r n plus one plus one is equal to one plus r n epsilon n plus one. So I take this formula here, paste it inside here. One plus r n epsilon n plus one the top part, we need the bottom part as before, we just insert what is Sn, what is the previous one plus the interest rate. Uh, and then you're given, uh, given Fn. All right, so now we have, you have your you're trying to find a recursive formula for the EVs. So what is Fn plus one is evaluated at these, these random quantities, but most of them are measurable and this one here is independent. So we're in good shape for the independence lemma. Well, what does it say? You take out, you evaluate this one here, epsilon n is either u or d. So this is one plus Rn times say U. And we can see, oh, I skipped a step here. As we could see in the, uh, the first calculations where we just went back one period, you see the one plus Rn's. Um, uh, I messed it up by T. We're dividing by Sn outside. Ah, oh, messing this up. Messing this up like this parentheses here, it doesn't go all the way down. You just go on the top part. This goes on the top part and then on the top part. So this is one plus Rn times U. 
everything divided by SN0, one plus R. And then times the probability of a U, this is P tilde, plus one minus P tilde. And then the same sign. And then <clears throat> now we see that the SNs, this is what we're working on, right? This, the left-hand side is equal to all this mess here on the right-hand side. So we see that the SNs, the SNs, they cancel out. We'll have P tilde, we have one minus P tilde, and we have the FN. So FN one plus RN, after multiplying through with SN zero, this will be equal to P tilde Fn plus one times one plus Rn times a U divided by one plus Rn. And the same thing with the other one. One minus P tilde Fn plus one, one plus Rn times D everything divided by one plus Rn. So what is my function? I replace, I replace one plus Rn with X. So I'll get here P tilde, Fn plus one of X times U divided by X plus one minus P tilde, Fn plus one times X D divided by X. Right, so this is my recursion. I have Fn x. This is this is the Martingale property. If I know what Fn plus one is, I can get Fn using this recursion, and I end up at the end. I know that this is this is just the x function. So this here is a recursion a recursion for how to compute the f's. You start out with the last function, and then you take the last function, you plug it in here. So you know, if you want to compute what F capital N minus one is, you just put uh, if N, if capital N here would then just be X. So this will be X U here and X D here. And one could ask, so what, what is the general, what kind of a formula, <clears throat> what kind of a formula would allow for, uh, can we solve such a recursion? Is it possible to solve it? Like we write out formulas explicitly for Fn. And uh, in this particular case, this is possible. Again, so it's, uh, let's try, try Fn of X to be Bn, then you have x to the one plus n minus capital N. Let's see if we can get this to work. So we have to determine what these Bn's, the coefficients. Let's figure out what they are. If I want to get f capital N of x to be x. And I take little n to be capital N in the formula, you're going to get x here. So this here is equal to B capital N times x. So I solve here, I'm going to get that Bn is equal to 1. Now, what about at earlier times? Well, at earlier times, we have this one. So for n less than capital N, I take the formula, I plug it into this recursion here and see what I get. So on the left-hand side, I'll get Bn x one plus n minus capital N. And then on the right-hand side, I'll get P tilde divided by x times, and now I'll go one up. Instead of n, I need to have n plus one here. So I have Bn plus one times 
and then this is xu to the power one plus n plus one minus n. Uh, plus the other term plus one minus p tilde over x. If n plus one, this is going to be bn plus one, and then xd to the power of one plus n plus one minus n. Okay, so what is bn? Well, we can see we divide here by x, so we're going to go one down over here. This here is equal to p tilde. Then you have bn plus one. You have x u. Break it up. Instead of having two, I'll have x. x to what power? This is going to be one plus n minus capital N. And then the u is going to, we don't divide it by u, so u has to have all of them u2 plus n minus capital N. And this is great because that's the same term as I have on the left-hand side. And then I have one minus p tilde uh, over x, b n plus one. And now instead of x u, I'll have x d. I have x is the same, the x from downstairs, I get one plus n minus capital N, and then with the D, I have to keep it two plus n minus capital N. So I want I want the right hand side to be equal to the left hand side. I can now cancel out. I can cancel out the x's because it's the same power on both sides, and I get the recursion. I get the recursion for the. Uh, I get how a, I can. There's a formula for now how I get B n in terms of the latter one. This is equal to p tilde bn plus one uh, u2 plus n minus capital n plus one minus b tilde bn plus one d times two plus n. we've been able to success so we've, we've been able to solve this recursion here for it might look a bit messy but uh, there is a way to write out uh, an explicit solution to to what what these functions here are you're given you're given by these uh, these power functions here. so this allows us to compute uh, this allows us to compute uh, the conditional expectation of uh, one plus r n divided by s n How does that sound? Could we follow this? It's a bit messy, but we're, we're trying to get at how to compute, how do we compute an expectation of this, this form here? So this here was one, one component. The other component that's in there is, um, is uh, there's the size to compute. This, this was one plus Rn divided by S and zero. We also want to compute, um, we're also interested in computing the conditional expectation of this one over Sn zero given, uh, given if n. And here the claim is that I can find another function. I can find another function Gn, such that when I value Gn at one plus Rn over Sn zero, I'm going to get exactly this conditional expectation. And so how would we do this one? How would we compute this conditional expectation? Well, it's the same thing we're going to, we're going to be looking for a recursion. So we start out at the end. This is G N of one plus R N divided by S N. When little n is equal to capital N, this is just one over this n zero. So what should G be? G n of x. Okay. 
it should end up being one. <clears throat> what should it be at earlier time? So if I look at n less than, well, I want to have the formula. I want to have the formula. So I'll use iterated expectations as before. Uh, right, so here I need to express, I need gn in terms of gn plus one. Right, that's the goal. And how would I get it? Well, I'll use the martingale property, right? This here is a martingale. So I'll write gn one plus rn over sn zero. I'll use conditional, iterated conditional expectations. I'll write this here as e tilde n of e tilde n plus one of the same quantity. Right, and then I'll use that the inner one, that the inner one is this gn plus one. I'll use that the inner one is gn plus one, one plus r n plus one. And then this time I'm gonna make sure that I put, put the money market account outside. And how would I work it out now? <clears throat> Comes the time to use the definition of the model. So this is Rn plus one is equal to Rn plus one plus one is equal to one plus Rn, and then this epsilon. So that this formula. This is one plus Rn times this epsilon. And this time the discount factor is all the way outside. <clears throat> and so we are measurable, most of it is measurable, but not all of it, this epsilon n plus one is independent. So we use the independence lemma as before, we write this as an expectation. We write this expectation as p e tilde g n plus one, one plus r n, and then this can be u and d. So this is a u here divided by s n zero, one plus r n plus one minus p tilde. G n plus one, one plus R n, and then so you have a D is in zero, one plus R n. Okay, that is the left hand side. You can see again that the money market account cancels out. And I'm left here with G n of one plus R n is equal to P tilde, G n plus one, one plus R n times U divided by one plus Rn. And over here, one minus P tilde, Gn, Gn plus one, evaluated at one plus Rn times D, divided by one plus Rn. So we replace one plus Rn with X. Then we want to get this recursion. Gn of x is equal to p tilde gn plus one of x divided by x. And here we have a u plus one minus p tilde gn plus one of x d divided by x. So we have a recursion. We also know that at the end, this is going to be one. So just as for the for the FNs, we have a recursion. We have a way to calculate GN from GN plus one. Um, can we solve it? Uh, yes. So let's try a solution of the form GN of X from some constant CN, then XN minus capital N. <clears throat> so we start at the end. I want gn of 
x to be equal to cn of x to the zero. Okay, so that's cn, and on the left hand side is equal to one. So that's going to give us the last coefficient. And then what about earlier coefficients? Well, we take we take our guess and we plug it into the recursion. On the left hand side, we'll have so it will be cn x n minus capital n. Now on the right hand side, we will have p tilde over x. We will have g n plus one evaluated at x u. So this will be uh, c n plus one evaluated at x u to the power n plus one minus n. We have the other one, one minus p tilde divided by x. We have g n plus one, so this will be c n plus one, x d to the power n plus one minus. And we want to match them up. The left hand side has to be matched up with the right hand side, and you can see the thing that makes everything work is that I'm dividing here by x, because it will cancel out that one power here. For the x, but not for the u. And the same thing over here, I'm dividing here by x. So you get n plus one minus one because you're dividing by x. And so the powers match up for x. And you're going to get that cn uh, is equal to, it will be p tilde, cn plus one, u to the power n plus one minus n plus one minus p tilde, cn plus one, d to the power n plus one minus n. So you have your coefficients, <clears throat> you start out at one, and then you're given in this recursive formula. This is how we calculate these two sets of functions. I know this looks messy, but I wanted to show you because what we're going to do next is it's going to simplify what, what we're doing here quite a bit. Um, I want to give you an impression of that you, you can calculate these uh, uh, these quantities in a in a specific model. And you can see the model doesn't even look it doesn't look tremendously complicated, right? It's just this is how we calculate interest rates. And now uh, now we have these two functions, and so how do we get the zero? How do we get the uh, forward price? So we should recall how the forward price is given. Recall that uh, F0 solves, uh, call that F0 solves, well, zero is equal to, and then the payoff, uh, the payoff was Rn minus F0 divided by, so that was the payoff, so we discounted by the bank, and then we compute the expectation. And what do we have available to compute this? We have these two functions that we, that we worked on. We have these two functions that we, these two sets of functions that we worked on. We have, uh, we have F0, we have F0, we have F0 of one plus R0, we have that this is equal to the expectation of uh, one plus Rn divided by Sn zero. So that's that's one we have. And the other one was the G. This was equal to the expectation. What was G equal to? G uh, was was this one we have here. So G zero evaluated one plus Rn is just gonna give us, these are the, uh, the zero coupon one prices. G would give us uh, one over Sn zero. <clears throat> right, so if zero solves this one, so, we can move F0 to the other side. You're going to get F0 times this expectation of 
one over is in zero. This should be the expectation of R n over is in zero. So we have these two functions now. So the first one, the first one, this is exactly my G. So I have F zero, G zero, one plus R zero. And now the other one, the other one is gonna be, uh, how do I express R n? Well, I need to take one minus the other. So I'll have to take F zero, one plus R zero minus, and then the other one, G zero times one plus R zero, not times, G zero evaluated one plus R zero. We solve if zero is equal to, uh, the forward price is equal to, divided by G zero. So that's the forward price. Then if you want, you can take these expressions that we calculated. You can take these expressions with the G, G zero is equal to that Z zero to uh, times this X to some power. So this will be minus N. follow this or was it I except for all the, the calculations and the details so, so we took uh, we considered a forward uh, written on an interest rate and so the payoff of a long forward is going to be this difference okay we want to find the, uh, the constant such that the uh, the value of the payoff at time zero is equal to zero okay and so that that means that we have to compute these two expectations. And the way that we did it went through computing these two expectations, right? The highly related one of them is exactly the same and the other one we can get out as a difference. And um, so we had to find a way to compute these expectations. And the way that we did it was this recursive, uh, this recursive uh, formula that uh, this recursive procedure that we have, um, that we have used uh, several times before. And we go, we start from the right and we go one step back uh, each time and ultimately end up at the initial point. And this is, this is really what we need. What we need is to compute these ones here, we're conditioning on F zero, and these are just the unconditional expectations. Are there any questions on this problem on forwards? Okay, then if that's not the case, then as you can see from this, this is pretty messy, right? That even a relatively simple, a relatively simple model for the interest rate led to five pages of calculations for how to get the forward price. So surely there must be a better way of doing this. And there is, and this better way of doing it is called forward measures. And so this is where we need these Radonikram derivatives that, that we have talked about, that we have talked about um, a few lectures ago. But the, the hard part is, so it's, so forward measures, so it's, it's, uh, it's complicated to compute, um, to compute expressions like, it's complicated to compute expressions like um, Sn divided by uh, Sn zero condition on uh, Fn. So maybe you want to put it up there. So it's, it's complicated to compute expressions like this. And what we were interested in was really just the case when n was little n was equal to zero. Just look at the example we did. This is involved. So can we come up with something better? 
And the answer is yes, we can actually come up with something better. So these forward measures, so P, P tilde, and then I'll put an M up here, P tilde M, M going from one to infinity, you called forward measures. Right. And the way that we prescribe them is by prescribing the rata nicotine derivative. So I'm going to prescribe P tilde M's rata nicotine derivative with respect to P tilde. The way that this is prescribed is as uh, one over the money market account. Right. M here goes there and then divided by the zero coupon bond. So one over the money market account, this is strictly positive, right? Remember what it means. So when I look at P tilde, a set, how do I compute it? I calculate this by computing an expectation on the P of an indicator for the set times the rather nickel derivative. This year is going to help. This year is going to help quite a bit. And the reason that it's going to help is because of base rule. So what you see here is if I'm interested in this one, for example, if I'm interested in, in this expectation here. I'm interested in this expectation here. What I can do is I can write this one over SN, SN divided by SN zero. This is exactly this rather than the derivative. So if I multiply and divide by the zero coupon bond, this is a constant, right? This is just the initial value of the zero coupon bond at time zero. Then I, I would have the rather nickel derivative in here times SA. So I can absorb this rather nickel derivative into, into the change of measure. And so instead of E tilde here, So if we tilde here, I will write, I'll write this tilde and then an M and then SN. But so all that matters. So all we need is this SN distribution. Uh, now I messed up the indices, All right? So this M here, this doesn't go well. If there's no M on the left-hand side, so there shouldn't be no M on the right-hand side. It should be capital M. Here. So the expectation that we are we are interested in can be expressed as the zero coupon bond times uh, the expectation of this uh, of this random variable under a different measure. Here we have the P tilde measure, here we have the forward measure. So this here is the, this is the expectation and this one here is expectation under the forward measure, which is still an M. So if, if we know what the distribution of this random quantity is under these forward measures, it's gonna become a lot easier because you just have to take the zero coupon bond price and multiply it onto that expectation.
So all we need is this distribution under P tilde in. Of course, <clears throat> what about what about the one at the later time? What about the one at the later time? Well, uh, let us recall base rule. Let us recall base rule. If I um, if we have the process. Let's call it C M N. That's going to be the conditional expectation of the right undercurrent derivative dP tilde M dP given F M. So here N is equal to one, two, zero, one, two, all the way up to M. So recall that this here is a martingale. And then what the space rule say? So base rule says that this is a martingale right with if I take C, if I take C M M, I'll just get the red and the derivative. But I'm, I could be interested in this thing at earlier times. And if you look at base rule, so let What could we do? We could let um, let x let a be uh, f m measurable. And what does base rule say? Well, if I want to compute the conditional expectation under this forward measure of a given f n, recall what base rule says is that this is equal to. This is equal to what do I need to do is I have to multiply in the right nickname derivative. So I'm switching here from the forward measure to the risk neutral measure and multiply in the right nickname derivative. This is CMM -M because A was FM measurable given FN. And then I have to remember to divide by the right nickname derivative, the process, but now evaluated at time n. Okay, so there are, there's work to be done here. This first one, this first one I can plug in because I know what that one is, but what about this one? What is he equal to? <clears throat> so I can write this here as the top one I know what is, so I can plug him in. I can plug him in, this is the right and equilibrium derivative at the end. Times the random variable a given it in. And then the bottom one, this is this conditional expectation. And what is c equal to? dp m dp given it in. But what is this equal to? So we need to compute. <clears throat> we need to compute two conditional expectations. So the top one and the bottom one, let's try to work out what they are, we simplify a bit. I work out on the bottom one. So E tilde, the conditional expectation of the right and the derivative, dp tilde m over dp given of n. Like this here is our c m n. And so what we do is we plug in the right and derivative. What is the formula? Well, the formula, the formula is one divided by SM zero, everything divided by the uh, zero coupon bond, B zero M condition on FM.
So I can take that as a constant. You can go upside. This is one over B zero M. Now what I have inside is more is more tricky, but <clears throat> I could I could um, multiply and divide by the same quantity. So if I would if I put S here, so this one just goes outside, and then I want to write inside here. Uh, I want to write inside here, I want to have SN0 upstairs and then SM0 downstairs. What I did was I took out, I took out the constant coefficient. And so here, for this to be true, I need to divide by the money market account at time n. This one can go in and outside when it's an expectation because it's measurable. So that makes the equality sign true. And the reason I do it is because this quantity here, this is exactly my zero coupon bond at time, uh, at time n. Like, and I know when I discount, I'm gonna get a martingale, right? So this quantity here, this is indeed a martingale. Right, this here is a P tilde martingale. And this is a constant, so constant times a martingale, you still have a martingale. But all in all, what this, what this shows me is what, what is the bottom part? Well, the bottom part is this one over B zero M one over S N zero and then the zero coupon one B N M. That was the bottom part of this expression. So what about the top part? What about the top part? Yeah. The top part in this expression. Let me write it out. Write it up. The top part, you know, we'll plug in what the radonuclear derivative is again. The radonuclear derivative, it was what we had here. This was one divided by, this was one divided by the bank uh, at the end, and then divided by the zero coupon bond times A. Condition on it. And again, of course, I can pull out the initial zero coupon bond price. This is just a constant. And then I'm left here with, well, A divided by what I have here. So this, ra this ratio, this ratio that we're looking at, <clears throat> is given by the ratio of this one and that one. And you can see there are some common factors. Right? There's a common factor here of the initial values, they will cancel out. Right? And I'm dividing by this one. I'm dividing by this one. So I'm, I'm actually multiplying onto the zero, multiplying onto the bank account. So you combine and you will get. Combine to get that the Conditional expectation that I'm interested in, this one here, E tilde M of A given if N, <clears throat> there's a formula for it. And the formula is this one. That one here cancels out with this one here, and then I have to multiply onto SN zero. And then I have to divide by I have to divide by B. So it's a long formula, but nonetheless, <coughs> nonetheless, this is exactly what is needed for, for futures for the forward price. So, so the forward price, let's recall it again, right? You have your S N minus the forward at time n, I don't want this to be equal to zero. I want to compute the conditional expectation of all of this times Sn zero given the <clears throat> And so what do we have is, uh, I'll move the Fn to the other side. Fn is, is measurable, so you can travel outside. Then I'll have, the expectation left of 
is in zero is capital in that's this guy and then i want this to be equal to and then i have the troubled term is this sn divided by sn zero right this is the one and it's not very easy to handle but you see magic now because what i have here this is my b n m and i'm missing a term here this is multiplied off here and what i have here this is exactly this is exactly this one here control inside so i'm i'm ending up here with fn being nothing else than the conditional expectation under the forward measure conditional expectation under the forward measure of sn And so this is the key formula forward prices forward prices they are simply just given as expectations under the forward measures of their uh, of that random variable that you've written right so so forward prices these events the martingales under uh, the martingales under until then this this area should be at I get in here is what goes goes, goes here. But so this is the reason that we've been working on rather than doing this for a couple of weeks. It is so we can say that forward prices they have this martingale properties. They do not have the martingale property on the P tilde, but you have it under these forward measures. So whenever you need to compute a, a forward price, what is really needed is to compute this conditional expectation. Yeah. Are there any questions or comments about, about this material? One thing that's coming up and has come up um, is this role of stochastic interest rates? Right? I started out saying now that it's important that R for fixed income, the, the new feature is these stochastic interest rates. And you can see why when you look closely at, at this random negative derivative here. Because <clears throat> here we have one over the bank, and here we have a zero coupon, here we have the zero coupon bond. Right? So let me make a little, little note here. When, when Rn is not random, then the zero coupon bonds is nothing else than one over the bank. So this random nucleum derivative, dp tilde m over dp, this is simply just one. So the reason that we haven't seen these forward measures before when we did equity is because it's because the interest rate was not random. And so these this ratio here would always be one and all the forward measures would just be equal to the, uh, the P tilde measure. So the, the reason that we've seen these forward measures now and not earlier is because we have stochastic interest rates. And the message is that when you have stochastic interest rates, it's not just P tilde that's important. Uh, there are other measures, in particular, these forward measures that are important. 
later on today, we're going to be talking about, I don't know if you have time to, to do it, but hopefully later on today, uh, we'll talk about swaps. And when we talk about swaps, there's yet another measure. There's something called a swap measure. And the swap measure is given by a random nickname derivative, a different one than this one, but nevertheless, it's given by a random nickname derivative. And, um, uh, and, and, and so, so when you're doing swaps, then you want to use a swap measure. When you do forwards, you want to do a forward measure. When you do equity, you need to use the risk neutral measure. Right, so depending on the application, there are different measures at play. These measures, you have different uh, properties, and um, but they all characterized in terms of random nickname derivatives, right? The P tilde measure itself is characterized as a uh, random nickname derivative with respect to the P. So, right. We maybe we should try to highlight that. This, this is just another, another thing to note. So just as just as P tilde is given by a random nucleum derivative with respect to P, right, this was given as how, how was the formula? This was something like um, was it P tilde over P to the power number of heads times one minus P tilde divided by one minus P to the number of tails. Does anybody remember this radonicum derivative? Does anybody remember it? Look up. Look up changes of meshes. I know it's been a while since we did it, but nevertheless, here it is. Right, the random nickname derivative is this ratio p tilde over p number of heads times q tilde over q to the number of tails. But we worked with this one here a while back. So p tilde is given by a random nickname. So is p tilde m like dp uh, tilde m is given by a random nickname derivative, but not with respect to p, but with respect to p tilde. Like this one here was equal to, uh, what was it? One over is zero m divided by the zero coupon bond. So we could combine, we can combine to get that the random nickname derivative with respect to the forward mesh, the forward mesh is around the derivative, but not with respect to P tilde, but with respect to P. Like the way that you do that is, is what? You would just multiply. So you get DP tilde over DP tilde. So DP tilde M over DP times, and then DP tilde over DP. And so you can write all that out, this becomes one over SM zero divided by the zero coupon bond, and then times times the random nickname derivative P tilde over P. So now we are on we up to time M. So we need the number of heads up to time M, one minus P tilde, number of tails up to time M. So the forward measure also has a random nickname derivative with respect to P. And you simply get it by multiplication. And there are other properties that you can get out. One, one other thing that we had talked about when we talked about random derivatives was the Martingale property. So we also know, we also know that, uh, so on the P tilde, on the P tilde, we know that um, on the P tilde traded uh, traded security traded securities um, have discounted discounted have discounted prices uh, have discounted prices that are martingales. <clears throat> okay, so what does that mean? So, 
security securities have discounted prices that are marking you so so say that um say that x tilde divided xn say that xn divided by the bank this is a p tilde martingale now what we want to do is we want to see what is in a martingale what is in a martingale under uh, the forward measures so our claim is this martingale property here is moved over to a different martingale property under the forward measure. So let's say that this is this is the case, right? So X here, this is a traded securities price process. And you'll be discounting by the bank, but what is the claim here? Well, if I divide here by the zero coupon bond instead, the claim is that this is a P tilde M martingale. Like, and how does one prove it? Well, we use base. We use base. Base says that this is equivalent. This says, base says that this is equivalent. What I need to do is I need to know what the Radonikonim derivative process is between P tilde and, and, um, and P tilde M. So we know that DP tilde uh, M DP, conditional expectation, this is that process uh, CMN, which we worked out somewhere to be. We worked it out to be <clears throat> this guy here. We worked him out to be this mess. So a constant divided by the bank and then the zero coupon bond. So let me write that here. Just copy paste from page 14. What was it? One over the zero coupon bond, initial price, and then it was the zero coupon bond price. And then it was one over one over the money market account. At the base says that this Renanicum derivative process, you can move. So this is needed to go from Martingales on the one measure to Martingales on the another measure. And base says that because you have a martingale, this is a P tilde martingale, we'll have that if I multiply onto the Radonikov derivative, We need to go the right way. So base says what? Base says that this is a P tilde martingale. This is a this is a P tilde M martingale. If and only if if and only if when you multiply on to the zero coupon bond, when you multiply on to the um, the nucleum derivative, you're going to get a P tilde martingale. So we do that times C and M. That this is a P tilde martingale. This is base. And so what do we do here is we take we take that expression we have up here and we plug it in here. This is equal to xn times the random derivative one over p zero m n m one over is n zero, and then we see stuff canceling out. Right, this expression cancels out. This expression cancels out, and here we have that ratio is good. You're going to get xn divided by sn zero times this constant. Like this here is a constant. So anything traded divided by the zero coupon bond is going to give you a martingale on the default measure, if and only if 
anything traded discounted by the bank is going to be a market unit, right? And this is true. So we can move these right, nickname derivative processes, they allow us to move martingales on the one measure to martingales under, uh, under the, uh, the measure that has that right, nickname derivative process, right? So we, we're used to having that, say the stock price discounted is a martingale, and we have forward measures, then if XN is a stock, a traded stock price, then it will be the stock price not discounted by the bank, but the stock price discounted by the zero coupon bonds that will have the martingale property. Right, so things are changing a little bit because we have these stochastic interest rates. We're used to just focusing on the bank account. Now, with the stochastic interest rates, uh, focus on the, um, the zero coupon bonds. Okay, I think this is a good place to take a little short break. Are there any questions before we take a little short break? That's not the case. And after the break, what we're going to do is we spend a lot of time now doing forwards. Um, after the break, we'll do futures. And then we'll do a couple of examples of futures. Are there any questions? Otherwise, we'll take a little break and uh, switch over to the different Zoom link. Let's switch over.